Hey, my friend, what's going on? You've surely heard of peptides by now, but if you haven't, then they're just a little bit smaller than proteins and they have the same building blocks as proteins. And as you know, proteins do basically all the job in your body of maintaining your life and maintaining normal function day to day. And so peptides have been found to have various anti-aging and healing benefits in your body. Today, we're going to do another session with a peptide expert, and we talk about bioregulator peptides. These are even smaller. These are very, very small peptides, anywhere from two to four amino acids. And so what we learn about is what makes these peptides super special and very, very cool, and how you can use these for very specific organs or even tissues in your body if you are having problems or conditions related to those organs or tissues. So stay tuned for a very cool interview with my friend, Natalie Nidham. If you're enjoying the information on this channel, then please make sure to hit the subscribe button down below so you can get notified when we release new videos. Our goal on this channel is to help you look and feel younger so you can live your most confident and adventurous life. Also, if you're interested in getting thicker, fuller, stronger, and longer hair, then make sure to check out fullyvital.com. We're creating some really cool products and a natural hair growth system that you can use in tandem to really get the hair that you deserve. So if you're interested in that, please make sure to check out fullyvital.com. I'll make sure to put a link down below. With that said, let's dive right into the interview. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. Today, I'm excited to have my friend Natalie Nidham on the show, and we're going to talk about things that are near and dear to my heart and certainly to hers. These are peptides, which she's been become quite the expert in. In terms of an intro, Natalie is a holistic nutritionist and she's a human potential and an epigenetics coach. She has a Facebook group of thousands of people where they talk, you know, some of these peptides all day long. And uh, I met Natalie, I think it was a year I found out about her a couple of years ago, and then I met her at the biohacking conference recently in Orlando, Florida, and we had a great conversation. So I wanted to bring her on to talk about some of these peptides, but also bioregulator peptides, which she's going to delve deep into. And for those of you that are new uh, with peptides or haven't learned about them before, we did a whole interview back in a few months ago with Dr. Kent Holtorf. So you can go watch that as well. With that said, Natalie, welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks Show. Thank you so much for us. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having yeah, me. Absolutely. I'm glad to have you on. So in terms of your background, Natalie, I know that you have a very interesting background. You've done a lot of things. Walk the listeners through how you got into health and then how you got into peptides in particular. Mm, yeah, good question. Um, I guess, well, I got into health. I've always been interested in health. I studied physiology when I was in, I guess you would call it in the States college here, we call it university. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, the two things, one is I've always been really fascinated by the human body. And two is I've always had kind of nothing crazy life-threatening serious. Well, a couple of times it became life-threatening, but I've always had my own health issues, you know, and I think a lot of us, when you have health issues, you have one of two ways to go. Either you fit, sit there and go, okay, I'm just going to go see a doctor and whatever they tell me is going to be my thing. Or I might go see a doctor. I might not like what they tell me. And I think there's something more to this, right? And I've always really inherently believed that the human body is really, it's such a powerful creation that has the possibility of healing itself in ways that we don't even understand. Right. I mean, I think that those of us who studied the human body, <laughs> you know, there's two things. One is you learn things that will blow your mind. Like there's little engines inside your mitochondria that spin at 21,000 RPM. Like that's crazy. Like that's ridiculous. Right. But on the other hand, but then you learn that as much as we know, there's at least as much, if not 10 times more that we don't know. <laughs> right. So, I think this fascination with the human body, the belief that our bodies can heal and, you know, this kind of perpetual quest for health has always been with me. But, you know, most of my professional career I spent in advertising sales and publishing, which has nothing to do with what I do now. But I was also always a fitness instructor. So I always kind of kept my hand in this world in a small way. And it wasn't until I would say, I think it must be now almost 12 years ago, maybe more 
that I woke up one morning after reading countless books and talking to people's ears off who wanted nothing to do with the topic about health and nutrition and all that stuff, that I finally decided to bite the bullet and go back to school and study nutrition, which I did. And, um, and you know, that was just the beginning of this lifelong journey. And, um, you know, once you get into this field, and maybe, well, all of us in this field of whether it's health optimization, or if we want to call it biohacking, whatever it is, fundamentally, we are lifelong learners. Like we are people who we learn, and then we find something else, and we dive down that hole, and then we find something else. It's, it's very rarely is it a go to school, learn something, and then you're done. I think that for all of us, having that open openness to be to learning new things and challenging what we think we know constantly is well, it, it's what makes us who we are. And I think it's it's a powerful thing. Although other people might say, "Well, you're always changing your mind," and I'm like, "No, I'm not changing my mind. I'm upgrading my information and sharing it with you guys." So, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. No, I love what you said about the human body's ability to heal. And I believe that so much now. And, you know, I've been down the path where I'd go to a doctor and specifically, I went to a doctor for a hair loss back in the day. And immediately they recommended a pharmaceutical, which I reluctantly mm -hmm. got on because I was like, well, I want to keep my hair. It's a big deal for me, my hair uh, to me, for me to have hair. And so uh, that was one of my first signs of where I was like needing a, a medication or I thought I needed a medication. Yeah. And then turns out as we get into the field, uh, this health field, and we try to figure out the challenges that we're having, it leads us to all unique different kinds of ways and, you know, finding natural ways to help whatever conditions you are experiencing and heal those naturally is such a satisfying journey to go on. It's, it's sometimes long and painful, but it's so satisfying once you find results and I would say this, the answers are all out there and there's more mm -hmm. and more information coming out already. So if you have a condition that you think that, oh, I have, I'm, you know, I've got this condition, I've got to go to a doctor. No, you don't have to go take a pharmaceutical. I think nine times out of 10, you could find ways naturally to heal a lot of those conditions. I'm not saying don't go to a doctor, but I would say yeah. consider, get a second opinion, right? Uh, yeah. Ask people that are, that are tuned into to health and wellness an alternative physician, maybe uh, a second opinion of what they, what you might be able to do. Okay. So we also want to talk about peptides in particular, which I think that mm -hmm. you've become quite the expert on lately. And so I, again, for folks listening, you can go back and watch the, or listen to the other interview with Dr. Kent Holtorf, but Natalie, if you could sum up peptides and what they are in just, you know, a couple of minutes, how would you do that? Ah, that would be hard. Um, so you also asked how I found peptides and I found peptides at a conference. That's, mm -hmm. that's how we find a lot of things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially what are peptides and it depends on which peptides we're talking about. So we're going to talk briefly about really two different categories of peptides today. We're going to talk about the peptides that are becoming much better known right now. So the BPC-157, the thymosin alpha-1, the thymosin beta-4s. And then we're also going to talk, touch on another category of peptides that are called bioregulator peptides. But going back to that first category, these are synthetically generated amino acid chains. So an amino acid chain is essentially a small protein in this case, a peptide is a small protein, typically under 50 amino acids long. Um, and what these peptides do is they have receptors in the body where they will kind of, they will attach to a receptor and they will initiate a cascade of reactions, of healing, of whatever the case may be. So they're, they're basically signaling molecules. Very often, I would actually would say always, they are naturally occurring compounds in the human body. But what we've done is we've isolated kind of the most active fragment of it, if you will, or specific fragments in order to initiate responses and cascades that we're looking for. Is that that, yeah, yeah, that does. That's very interesting. So amino acids, as you mentioned, they're the building blocks of life. And most people think of amino acids in the context of, I need my protein after a workout, right? Amino and acids you do. Provide, provide the protein <laughs> and, and you do. Yeah. And so amino acids are the fundamental building blocks of proteins. And what Natalie just mentioned is that when there's over 50 of these amino acids joined together into a molecule, that's a protein. But if there's under 50, then this is called a peptide. And of course, if there's one, that's an amino acid. And so are there differences in length, even within the peptides? Peptide world absolutely. Yeah, what, absolutely. How would you describe the differences? Are they smaller peptides and bigger peptides? 
Well, they can be any as small as two amino acids and as long as 50, right? So thymosin beta-4, which is a very well-known amino acid uh, peptide, has 43 amino acids in that chain. And it's not like a long string. In that case, it's got different arms. And so there's different fragments of thymosin beta-4. And if you think about each fragment is like a key that will fit into a different receptor and initiate a different response. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we're starting to see some some uh, people, and he, actually Dr. Holtorf is one of them, where he's using different fragments of that thymus and beta-4 and using it in an oral supplement, which is really interesting because TB4, as it's also called, is not typically orally bioavailable. So most of these peptides you can't take by mouth because they will get, they'll get digested just like any protein in the stomach. The exception, there's a few exceptions to that. And one of them is BPC-157, which stands for body protective compound 157, which is a very, very powerful repair peptide, which is actually naturally occurring in our own gastric juice. And, and for some reason it gets a buy. I think it's, I think it's 15 amino acids long, So it's actually big enough that it should be identified by the body as something that needs to be chopped up in order to be absorbed and assimilated, Mm -hmm. but somehow it gets, it gets a free pass. Um, and it's, it, you can take it orally. It can be used by subcutaneous injection. It can actually also be used intranasally and even it has topical applications. So not all the peptides have that breadth of application, but that one in particular does. Okay. So let me ask you a different question. There's obviously, as you mentioned, there's different membranes in our body where these peptides have to pass through. One of that is the digestive tract, but also the intestinal wall where it has Mm -hmm. to go into the intestines and come back into the bloodstream. So that's one. Number two, you've got a cell membrane that's protecting the cell. The peptide ideally probably has to go through and inside the cell. Uh, And Mm -hmm. then three, okay. Uh, Let me finish on the, let me finish the membranes and then address them all. And there's mitochondrial membranes inside the cell. There's a nucleus membrane. So Mm -hmm. where are these peptides going and where are they attaching inside? So, I mean, look, I'm not a biochemist, but I will tell you this. In the case of many of these larger peptides, they're not going through uh, the membrane, like the cellular membrane, the nuclear membrane, or the mitochondrial Mm -hmm. membrane. What they're doing is they're attaching to receptors on the outside and they're initiating a cascade inside. That that's as that's what I know. Mm-hmm. Um, there could be somebody out there tearing their hair out going, no, that's not true. But when it comes, and this is where actually we can segue to the bioregulators a little bit, because the bioregulator peptides, what makes, there's a lot of things about them that make them unique. But what's really interesting about the bioregulators is that they're at most four amino acids long. Mm-hmm. So these are the teensiest, tiniest, like most infinitesimally itty bitty pieces of (laughs) protein you can imagine, they can cross through cellular membrane. They can also cross through a nuclear membrane. They can actually get to the DNA, they bind to the DNA, and they upregulate the production of proteins inside the cell. So they work quite differently than these other peptides that we're talking about. And so they have, in many ways, different applications. I would say that in many cases, you're going to get a faster effect and a faster response from the first peptides we were talking about, like the BPCs and the thymus and beta force. I kind of, um, I kind of refer to them, these guys, those guys as the SWAT team and the bioregulators, those are the guys that are doing the infrastructure work, right? So what the bioregulator, if you will, their, their, I don't want to call it their claim to fame, but but what they really are doing based on the research that we we've seen come and most of it's come out of Russia. So mm-hmm. these are were these were discovered by and developed by Professor Kavin, Vladimir Kavinson, who's from Russia, who basically did this seminal research like 40 years ago. So these compounds have been researched for a really long time. It's just that a lot of the literature is still not translated. But what he's found is that, and what he will talk about is that every tissue and organ in the body has what he calls a biological reserve. And that biological reserve is, I'm pretty sure, I think he said it was 32%. It was either 32 or 42%. I think it's 32%. And that, you can imagine that as your capacity for improvement, but the body needs that signal. And as we age, we, you know, things start to break down. We don't have as much growth hormone around. We don't repair as well. 
What the bioregulator peptides seem to do is they seem to have the ability to get into whether it's heart tissue or the pineal gland or the thyroid or the liver or the pancreas and initiate, upregulate production of those proteins that we need to rejuvenate the function of that gland or tissue or organ. Okay, fantastic. I want to ask you a couple more questions on the big SWAT team, on the SWAT team peptides, then we'll come back on the bioregulator ones. So I've been doing, I don't know if I mentioned you mentioned to you when we spoke last, when we spoke at the conference, I've been doing a few of these SWAT team peptides. I've been doing Epitalon, which is associated or helps with longevity or anti-aging uh, by function of increasing your telomerase uh, activation and uh, telomere length. And then there's others, like you mentioned, Thymosin Alpha-1. I've done that a couple of times. Natalie, and then I've also done GHKCU, which I didn't actually see much of a difference with, but obviously there's BPC-157, there's Thymosin Beta-4. There's a lot of these peptides that people have been doing. Um, what, I guess, to round out that conversation, I'd like to just kind of get uh, your take on why somebody would be using any of these peptides real quick. And obviously these are um, not to be ingested. Most of them are not. So give me the use case of why would use some of these four or five peptides, then we'll get into bioregulators. Well, actually, the first one you mentioned is a bioregulator. So epitalon is actually a bioregulator. Okay. It's only four amino acids long. What it is, is it's a synthetic. It's so we can talk about this more when we talk about bioregulators, but Mm -hmm. when we find bioregulators, we can get them in two forms. One is a synthetic amino acid chain, which is what you were using in the epitalon. And the other one is something that like this, which is actually an oral capsule. And it's actually the actual, how many times can I say the word actual? Sorry. It's the, it's an, it's an extract from whatever tissue gland or organ it is found in, in an, in a calf, in a, about a year old cow. And what they do is they extract the bioregulator. And what they're doing at the same time is most likely what they're also getting is a lot of synergistic compounds or um, cofactors, if you will, along with the amino acid chain. And so you're getting a slightly different effect maybe, but typically we would say that with the synthetic, like the epitalon that you're using, you will see a faster effect, but it might not last as long as you would get with something like this, which might take a little bit more time to do its magic, but the effects might be longer lasting. So that's just to to kind of clarify that a little bit. When it comes to, so you want to know about specific uses for BPC-157, TA1, and GHK? Yeah, just for the listeners. Yeah, so BPC-157 is the quintessential repair peptide. So people most, I mean, there's a couple of different, the thing with BPC-157 is it does a lot of different things. One of them is it helps very much with musculoskeletal injuries. Um, so you'll find a lot of people that are, that have any number of injuries will use BPC 157. They'll often use it with a couple of other peptides that work with it, but it is not only, and not only does it upregulate repair, but it's also anti-inflammatory. It has some analgesic effects and it's, so it's, and also what it does is it upregulates the expression of growth hormone receptors around muscles and fibroblasts, which amplifies the repair factor, if you will, because if at the same, well, first of all, if you're making a reasonable amount of growth hormone at night, it just means that growth hormone is going to have more places to kind of do its work because we need growth hormone for repair. As we know, the other aspect of BPC-157 that people talk about a lot, it it is magic for any healing, anything in the GI tract. So it's amazing for healing a leaky gut. It can be used for lower GI issues like IBS, IBD, colitis, Crohn's. Um, I mean, in, you know, in, it, it's not like you're going to take your BPC-157 and your Crohn's is going to disappear. But as part of a plan, a well-thought-out plan, it can really kind of speed up the healing and turn it on, if you will. It's great for any, like anywhere in the GI tract, so gums. Um, if people have GERD, it can help to protect from ulcers. Like it's, you know, just almost anything you can think of in the GI tract that goes wrong, it can be helpful. It's also good for the brain. It can be helpful for TBIs. It can be helpful for a lot of, it, you know, one of the things that BPC-157 does is it balances the serotonergic, dopaminergic, and GABAergic centers in the brain. So that can be really helpful in terms of mood balancing. 
Having said that, there's a small percentage of people that that backfires on. So when people are using BPC-157, I'm really careful to, you know, when anybody's using any peptide, I think it's really important to keep a diary and track how you're feeling and how your body's responding. Because in that small percentage of people, if they don't notice that they're having a negative um, kind of cognitive effect from the BPC-157, they could be kind of building up, you know, it, it might just, if they use it for too long, it might take them longer to kind of get rid of the, the negative effects. Um, and then the other thing that BPC-157 is good for is it seems to be able to normalize blood pressure in some cases. It's really good for kidneys. It's good for the heart. So it's kind of like this you know, full body peptide that seems to have a lot of benefits in many ways, because it has receptors in so many different places. So the one thing that I think is important to mention here is there's not years and years and years of double blind clinical trials on this stuff in use with humans. I would say BPC-157 has a fair amount of research behind it. Some of it is not published because again, it's coming out of the Ukraine or you know, or Croatia, I think there were a couple of researchers in Croatia that did a bunch of human experiments, only they couldn't publish it because they hadn't done the animal experiments first. <laughs> so, mm, interesting. Um, so there's a lot of information out there about this, but I think, you are you know, so I think that as much as we say, oh yeah, they're super safe, we, we don't fully know, mm. you know, they, they sure seem to be. And because they're endemic to the body, we believe that they are. And most of what we've seen is that they're quite good. But I think that people need to understand that you're now, you're stepping into the realm of biohacking. You're stepping into the realm of rolling the dice. You're making calculated risks. Um, there's lots of doctors using this stuff right now. So again, that should bring us a lot of comfort as well. Not that doctors are always right, but you know, these are smart people who've studied the human body extensively. They've observed, they've been running their own, you know, almost clinical tests in their own practices. Um, so anyway, not to get sidetracked for thymus and alpha one, that's another one you asked about. That's a peptide people will use for mostly for immune and inflammation. So it's naturally anti-inflammatory and TA1, as it's often called, well, what it will do is we have two arms to the immune system, the, you know, the, the innate and the extrinsic kind of thing. A lot of people are overactive in the TH2 and underactive on TH1 side. And so for that reason, TA1 will help to rebalance that. So it can be really useful for auto people with autoimmune conditions. But if you've got like severe autoimmune issues, this is one where you don't want to go in too hard, too fast, because what can happen is your teeter totter can do one of these and you might just end up feeling really crappy just in a different way than you were feeling before. Yeah. Um, and um, it also, I mean, it's definitely been, there's actually some trials that have been done over the last couple of years with a certain virus that's, you know, wreaking havoc with our world, um, where in hospitals in China, they used high dose thymus and alpha one on people who were severely ill with COVID and found that they had better outcomes than people who didn't get the thymus and alpha one. So not telling you that that's what you should do, but I'm telling you that, you know, there's definitely some evidence out there that this stuff is really powerful. And as a matter of fact, it is a drug, it's called Zadaxin. It's, I think it's legal in like 40 countries in the, in, in the world, mm -hmm. you know, I think most particularly in Europe and here or in the States, I think it has orphan drug status. So it's kind of like on the line. And to that end, the FDA has now designated that compounding pharmacies can no longer manufacture it. So it's gotten a lot of people pretty upset because it's becoming harder to find and more expensive when you can find it. Mm -hmm. So that's TA1. GHKCU is really interesting because it's only three amino acids long. It almost could be a bioregulator, although it wasn't discovered by Professor Kevinson. So I don't know if that's why it's not a bioregulator. Mm. But, you know, what's interesting about GHKCU is that most people know it as something that would, you would use for skin, something that would use for hair, um, but it has a lot of other properties. It's a very interesting, very tiny um, molecule that, and it seems that the tinier ones, they can get places, right? Mm -hmm. So it helps with wound healing. It helps with scarring. It helps with, it actually act, acts on over a thousand genes. It may actually be up to 4,000 genes. There's a university in the States, I think it was Stanford, did 
a study on GHKCU and we're like, this thing's just like flipping, flipping switches all over the place, up or down. Um, and from what they published, they said, you know, that it was all beneficial. I don't know that we know that for sure. But what's interesting about GHKCU, I think, is that if you look at the literature, when they got the best results with their little mice, they were infusing GHKCU almost continuously through the day. Mm. And so what we do is we tend to use it, you know, like, you know, once or twice a day, maybe twice a day. Um, And it would appear that maybe to get the real results, you almost need to do this thing. I actually, in my podcast, I interviewed um, a peptide expert by the name of Jean-Francois Tremblay, who owns a research lab in Montreal. And he actually went and bought an insulin pump and did this thing where he would infuse GHK over the course of 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And he believes that that's when he started to see some benefits, but, you know, it's got a big, big, big reputation out there, but a lot, but it doesn't always deliver. Right. So I think that part of it is we don't fully understand it yet. Maybe we don't fully understand how to use it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the last thing to say on GHKCU is in the topical world, when somebody thinks says it has GHKCU in it, it should be blue. And that's from the copper. CU is for a copper molecule. So GHK requires a copper molecule to be active, to be activated. Some of the things I've also seen is that, you know, like having a group with almost 10,000 people in it is almost like a living lab. And so some of the stuff I've seen is that there are certain people, groups of people that have found that I think it, it was for EDS or some kind of, of ligament issues. They found GHKCU really helpful for them. So the GHK with the copper, but the problem was because they were using high dose for like six months they ended up with an imbalance between their copper and their zinc. Mm. So they would end up with copper toxicity. So one thing that I think is important to understand is if you are going to use the GHK with the copper, then you want to keep an eye on your own levels. You can also use GHK without copper, but in that case, you still want to know what your copper status is because there needs to be copper in your body that that GHK can access to become activated. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I could keep talking on GHK, but I'm going to stop now. I know you have other questions. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I did, I was doing trace minerals or supplementing with them a while ago. And then I got a hair minerals test analysis done. And I realized that my copper levels were sky high. Yeah. So again, just make sure you test as you're doing some of these compounds. And the science is still new. Uh, there's a lot of science in Russia, the Far East, like you said, but some of the science is still new and it's coming out. So you are taking some, uh, or you're becoming your own experimenter in a way, yeah. in a, in yeah. a safe, mostly safe way, but uh, just know that. Okay, let's come back to the bioregulator peptides you're talking about. These are smaller three to four amino acids from what you mentioned, Natalie. And so these, you can take them orally. They go through a digestive tract. They're not broken down. And then they go through your intestine and reabsorb into the body. And there in the bloodstream, now they can go attached to specific sites or specific cells. You also mentioned that these come from um, either calves that are one year, one year old. So like uh, from cow calves. And so those uh, are mimicking the organ. Are they coming from organs or are they coming from all over the body? Well, they're coming and you know, for if you're using the pineal peptide, which is an, an epithalamin or mm-hmm. endolutin, like, and so here's the, here's the other funny thing about bioregulators, the nomenclature around bioregulators is crazy, right? So epitalon is the synthetic, epithalamin is the biologic, endolutin is the, um, it's like the trade name. And so you get all these crazy, it's somebody once said to me, oh yeah, bioregulator nomenclature, it's like the Ikea of the peptide world. <laughs> Nothing, none of the names actually mean anything to us, but, and so it's super confusing because, you know, you've got Vesugen and Vladonix and like all these crazy names that mean different things. But just one other thing, like there are some that are as small as two amino acids. Like I think Vilon is one of them. That's only two amino acids long. I could be wrong about that, but. Okay. So they're mainly organ specific or no? Organ tissue. Um, So for example, just to give you an idea, so there, I believe right now there are 21 
And I don't know that I could rattle them all off, but just to give you an idea, there's one for the pineal. So there's a pineal gland bioregulator, which would be extracted from the pineal gland. There's a blood vessel bioregulator, which would be extracted from the blood vessels, like the lining of the blood vessels of the animals. Mm -hmm. There's a heart bioregulator, which would be extracted from the heart. There's liver, there's pancreas, there's spleen, there's bone marrow, there's muscle, there's thyroid, there's adrenal, there's central nervous system, like the brain brain. There's, what am I forgetting? Eyes. Um, there's, I'm forgetting so many of them, but anyway, okay. you get the, you get the idea. Yeah. I mean, like, they're, so they're specific, but one thing I will say is they don't like one thing that I've learned recent, more recently is that even though epitalon is very specific to the pineal gland, it act, oh, and the thymus gland, thymus is huge. Um, it actually there, it can also have a positive impact on other, there are positive impact on other, other places, other organs in the body. Hmm. So it's really, really interesting. And then sometimes you'll see something where they'll talk in the literature about two peptides being present at the same, like two bioregulators being present at the same time, one bioregulator allowing the DNA helix to unfold and the second bioregulator now finding its site and being able to like, it's so cool. Right. I mean, I don't know. It's like propeller head central here, but I'm yeah, sitting there yeah. going, Oh my God, it's like a ballet. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. But, so, sorry guys. <laughs> no, it's, no I, I'm excited about this too. So for people listening, Natalie, the, they could, if they have a specific condition with their heart or they have endothelial dysfunction with their blood vessels or their eyes are not as good as they used to be, they could, you're saying they could take specific oral bioregulator, bioregulator peptides and that will over time heal and bring their eyes or whatever. Potentially. You know, I mean, it depends on, yeah, it depends on the issue, right? And the other thing I should say about the bioregulators is they are almost never used alone. They're almost always used in stacks. So yeah. let's say, for example, I have someone who, um, you know, and I don't, and I don't work with people that are very ill. If somebody's very ill and has a serious medical condition, I'm going to find them a functional medicine practitioner. I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to send them to people who are, I'm, I'm not a doctor mm -hmm. to start with, but let's say somebody's concerned about their blood pressure and it's starting to, you know, it's starting to show signs that it's not great. Um, what I would recommend to this person and what we would look at is the way I think about it is I'm like, so let's think about which organs, like what are the systems that are involved in blood pressure? Well, obviously we have the blood vessels and the blood vessel peptide bioregulator underpins almost every protocol that you can imagine. Because mm -hmm. why? Because in order for anything to happen in the body, we need amazing circulation to the cells to bring nutrients. And we need amazing circulation away from the cells to remove toxins and waste. Right. Yeah. So nothing's going to go well if you don't have that going for you. But next on the blood pressure train, I'm like, okay, well, you know, the heart's pretty important. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I'm probably going to go throw heart in there. And then if I think about blood pressure, I'm like, well, you know, the kidney's pretty damn important when it comes to blood pressure as well, because it's regulating fluids and this and that. So I'll probably throw that in there as well. And then the one that almost always gets thrown in because it does everything and it's like the master endocrine regulator is the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. And so pineal gland almost always has a place somewhere. But one thing I do want to say to people is that the bioregulators are not a take it for a week or 10 days or a month and everything's going to be fine. Usually this is, this is a long course um, strategy and you have to be doing everything else. You have to change your diet. You're going to have to look at your lifestyle. You're going to have to, maybe you may have to take some medication. Like, I mean, one thing is if you have a medical condition, medications sometimes are necessary. What they're, what we don't want to do is fully depend on them, right? Like depending on what your issue is, you may need medication, but the possible, the, the potential that we have here with the bioregulators is, is it possible that we can help the body to heal from within so that eventually we can not be as dependent on this regular um, medication, or maybe even not need it at all. Mm -hmm. And I know doctors who've seen this happen, but if you are on medication and you're hoping to get off of them, this is where you really want to be working with someone to kind of help you to understand what's going on and to titrate it so that it's safe.
Yeah. I wonder, I'd love to see some data on this, right? To say, okay, you're on a cholesterol med or you're on heart, you know, blood pressure medication. And if you start taking these compounds over a period of three to six months, you can start to titrate down your medication and keep monitoring your results. Make sure you're still mm-hmm. doing good. And at some point you can get to where at a point where you don't need the medication anymore, but then that'll beg the question. Then are you, you know, exchanging one dependency for a different one? Meaning, do you yeah. have to be on these peptides for the rest of your life? What do they cost per month? Cause the drugs aren't that expensive, right? So how would you address costs of these peptides? Well, look, first of all, you don't have to be on them in de- for the rest of your life all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. But think about this as we age, we don't repair as well. So you may have to do cycles of them as you age to keep, you know, think of it as, um, I don't know, think of it as painting your house, right? Or doing maintenance on your car. You can't just do an oil change on your car and think you're done. Mm-hmm. It's going to wear and tear. Things are going to, and if your car is not repairing itself, which your car never does, but if let's say as we age, we don't make as much growth hormone, we, you know, our systems or our mitochondria might be slowing down, whatever the case may be, we don't repair ourselves the way that we did when we were in our twenties, then we're going to have to kind of keep this up in some way down the road. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and it, does it cost more than medication? Hell yeah. But is it an investment in your, in your health? The challenge with a lot of medication and you know what, for us, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for allopathic medicine. So I have a lot of respect for, mm-hmm. for conventional medicine, as it were. What I think is that there, we just have, we are ha- having an increasing number of tools at our disposal to hopefully avoid needing that conventional medicine as much or need it less. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally in agreement. Like I don't want to get on any meds for the rest of my life. I'd rather take five supplements than get on one med. Right. So I'm with you. It's an option for sure. You know, you know, it's like proton pump inhibitors, for example. I mean, they have their place, Mm -hmm. but when they were originally developed, they were developed to be used for short term to allow things to heal. What we have instead is people who are on PPIs for years, like forever. Mm-hmm. And what and what we now know is that sets you up for massive problems down the road. Right. Okay. Let's talk about this. Let's. What is a? Let's say if you're considering the entirety of peptides, bioregulators, and you know the big guns or the big ones, or the other ones, or the other ones, <laughs> the others, <laughs> not a, the not so cool ones. What might you recommend, Natalie? If let's say I do not have a condition at the moment which I don't thankfully, but let's just say somebody that's on the younger side, thirties, forties, even fifties that has no pre-existing conditions. What might be an anti-aging protocol that they would start with using peptides for what, what are the combinations of peptides you would recommend to them? Um, I think someone in their thirties, I'd be pretty light-handed, right? So one of the things we can do, and when it comes to um, managing aging, one of the things we can look at is how fast are you aging? And we have some new tools and an increasing number of tools at our disposal to do this. Um, Things like biological age tests. So the DNA methylation clock, for example, Horvat clock, um, I will use, I use a test called True Diagnostic by that company. And what they do is they will measure your DNA methylation pattern, which will give them an indication or give you an indication of what is your biological age versus your chronological age, Mm -hmm. right? Um, the other way, the other thing to look at is your telomere length. Now telomeres, you know, it's funny, the person who discovered telomeres won a Nobel prize for it. And since then you have a bunch of people running around going, well, telomere length means squat. It doesn't mean anything because you can have long telomeres and you can still be sick, or you can have short telomeres and you can still be alive. This is true. But I think that if you have longer telomeres, then what telomeres are, are these little shoelaces on the end of your DNA. And think of every time that DNA replicates, you lose a little chunk off that shoelace until eventually it's short. It's called the Hartwick. I think there's a, the Hayflick. Hartwick. Hayflick. 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 That's yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's only so many times that DNA, because when it runs out of telomeres, it can no longer replicate. Well, you know, it. I think that if you can help your, tel- your those telomeres to stay longer, you have more opportunity, right? But what you don't want to do is 
keep those telomeres long and live a crappy life and allow for more damage to the DNA so that maybe you get DNA that's damaged that starts to replicate, like whatever the case may be, right? So so for me, whether you're in your 30s, your 40s, or your 50s, before you start playing around with this stuff, I think it's a great idea to start by understanding what is my biological age? What is my rate of aging? Am I aging faster or slower than, I don't know, how many times I've been around the sun, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Once you get that baseline, because you can find 30-year-olds who on the inside are kind of like 40-year-olds or a 30-year-old who's like a 20-year-old, which, you know, they're they're in pretty good shape. I might tell that person, keep living an amazing life and save your money, save it for when you're going to need it. To the 30-year-old who's more like a 40-year-old or the 40-year-old who's like a 50-year-old or whatever the case may be, we know that at seven years past your, if your biological age is seven years older than your chronological age, you have a 50% increased chance of all-cause mortality. Mm -hmm. So we want the other way around. We want to be at least seven years younger than our chronological age to reduce that all-cause mortality risk by 50%. So you want to be on this side of the equation, not that one. Mm -hmm. So I would say start with that testing. And once you understand where you're at, Now we can start to look at a protocol. And in this case, it would be more bioregulators than it would be the the tactical guys to me. That I mean, that's my personal opinion. I save the tactical guys when I need them, right? If I need to support my immune system, I'm going to use thymosin alpha-1. Now, I'm also going to be running thymogen, which is the thymus bioregulator on this side, because if that can help to restore function to my thymus gland, which I know has been involuting and reducing in function since I was 30, then I'm going to be healthier and I'm going to live longer. And, you know, this might be a good time to mention, you know, the, the, the study that Professor Kevinson did that really kind of spun people around is he did a couple of studies with elderly people. And then he did one with, with, um, with with uh, with factory workers, but the one he did with elderly people is he took people between, and actually they were factory workers. They were sixty five to seventy five year olds, I want to say, and he put them on. He had them use epitalon, and then in another one he had them use epitalon and the thymus bioregulator. And in both cases, the one was a 12-year study and the other was a, well, 12-year study, he showed that the all-cause mortality rate in the people who got the bioregulators was, I I think it was more than half less Mm. than the people who got just vitamins, right? So it was a double-blind study. Everybody got vitamins. They just didn't know which vitamins they were getting. Then he turned around and he took the 75 to 85-year-olds and he gave them Epitalon and the thymus. In this case, he was using epithalamin. So he's using the biologics, epithalamin and the thymus bioregulator. And in those people, the people who didn't get the bioregulators, like I think it was 80% of them were dead after six years. And in the other group of people, it was down to 40%. So it was dramatic. And what are we doing here? If you look at what the epitalon does is it restores your ability to produce melatonin. It resets your circadian rhythm. So what you have to think about is what are all the downstream effects that are coming from doing that kind of thing for the thyme and, and what do old people like elderly people die of very often they're dying from infection because their immune system starts to wane. We're seeing this in spades right now. Well, if we can help their immune system to be stronger, I mean, frankly, even if you believe in vaccines, you're going to mount a better response to a vaccine if you have a stronger immune system than if your immune system is kind of, you know, dragging itself around kind Mm -hmm. of thing. So, So based on that biological age result that you get back, you would then decide how aggressive do I want to be? Also, if you know that you have stomach issues, oh, there's a stomach bioregulator too. Also ovaries and testes and prostate. I, I will get them all out by the end of the podcast. <laughs> you keep me, keep me here long enough. Um, so I would look at what are the systems that I want to support as I'm getting older. And we would then cycle through the different bioregulators. One thing to mention is in those studies that Ka- Professor Kevinson did, the people were given the bioregulators for only two to three years. They didn't take them for 12 years. So it's important to understand, like, if you really think about what's happening here, if we're helping to rebuild an organ or function of an organ or a tissue of, or a gland, it's going to take time. But once you've done that rebuild, you've got some runway before you might want to repeat it again. 
right? Like back to your analogy of fixing your car or servicing it every few months or every few years, right? You get, yeah. once you have a new transmission in, then you've got a little bit of time before you need a second transmission. Yeah. Okay. That all makes sense. And luckily I've been on Epitalon, Epitalon and, uh, and time is an alpha one. I've done, you know, I've been doing that for, for like a year now. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, hoping to finish this cycle and then uh, look at some other ones. So I'm excited. Yeah, I'd look at the thymus by regulator, right? Okay. Because yeah. the thymus, it's, yeah. Yeah, thymus and alpha one, yeah, thymus and alpha one is a peptide that your thymus would produce. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, you have a offering where you help women, I think, with health and figuring out you know, their conditions and then helping them one-on-one, -on -one. how would you, how could you describe that to the audience? So i actually don't only work with women. I work with men and women and I work with people mostly, you know, who are looking to optimize their health and build longevity programs mm -hmm. for them. Okay. Um, I don't, you know, these days I don't take a ton of clients because I have the podcast and I've got the group and I've got all these different things going on, but I do work with people one-on-one -on -one um, for in that capacity, what I'm doing for women, um, that you're maybe alluding to is that I'm going to be hosting a retreat or co-hosting a retreat in the Dominican Republic sometime this spring. We're actually, the only thing holding us up right now is finding a place to host it in high season in the Dominican, <laughs> which is not easy because mm -hmm. everybody's heading for the beach these days, um, for good reason. Um, so we're, I'm just literally in, you know, it's now no mid November. So I'm hoping in the next week or so we'll be announcing the retreat in the, you know, for women and it's a longevity retreat. So we're, what we're hoping to do is get people to test their biological age before they come down, do some genetic testing. Um, we'll be doing live blood cell analysis and, you know, this will be one of those retreats where you're going to be busy because you're going to be learning, you're going to be doing, you're going to be, you know, it's kind of a bit of an overhaul, but um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun for people who are interested in this stuff. Fantastic. So longevity retreat, you got a podcast, you're helping people with individual, with their health conditions and goals, I would say. And then what's the Facebook group called? The Facebook group is called, so I tried to change the name of my Facebook group, but I don't think a URL ever changed. So I believe that if you look for biohacking superhuman performance, um, that's what it's, I think that's the URL for it. It's the facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash, or it's optimizing superhuman performance and biohacking superhuman performance is also the name of the podcast where I'm looking forward to hosting you for us very soon. <laughs> I'm looking forward to coming on. Thank you for that. Um, awesome, Natalie. This has been great. I am, I've learned a ton more about bioregulator bio peptides, which I didn't know about. I was just doing them the old school way, the injections just uh, <laughs> every couple of days, but yeah. now maybe there's a more refined approach where I could do this. Where would people even find some of these, obviously they, they should come to you and have a consultation and figure out what they need, but are these available in the United States to buy? Recently? So I, where I, so where I get, I, I have two sources, right? If I'm looking at the synthetics like you're using and um, which are the ones that are applied by subcutaneous injection, um, those I get from a place called canlabsciences.com. They're in Canada, but they actually ship to the States in like two or three days. And if people wanted, you know, if people have enough information and they think they want to order some, they could use, uh, there's a discount code for my group, which I can share here, which is O S is in Sam P is in Peter O S P one five, and that'll get you 15% off. And then for the bioregulators, I like to get them from a place called, uh, it's the, um, the website is profound-health.com. And that what they've done is this is a UK company and the owner has a very good relationship with Professor Kavinson. And what they've done is they've taken the oral bioregulators and they've taken that whole name game out of play. So if you look at this box that I have here, they've renamed them Nature's Marvels, but most importantly, it just says adrenal bioregulator on the box. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know the fancy name. You don't have to worry about what am I taking? This one is called the thyroid bioregulator. So it's not thyrogen with an E and an O and some other crazy name. Plus when it gets to customs, it's, these are nutritional supplements. And I think that the custom people feel so much happier when they can read the box versus see something covered in Russian writing, which, right. you know, might raise some suspicions. And if people were going to go to profound health and order um, bioregulators there, 
um, they can get 15% off their first order with promo code longevity15. And after that, they usually throw a little card in there and offer you 10% off and that kind of thing. The, <laughs> the, the oral ones are more of an investment, I would say, because especially um, because with the synthetics, we've recently figured out that a lot of the literature was was not properly translated from Russian and people are using about a thousand times the time, the dose that they need. You only really need a hundred micrograms a day. Uh, mm -hmm. And many people are using 10 milligrams a day because that's what's been said, you know, legit. Yeah. Um, so the synthetics can be pretty cost effective when you start to look at those numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate you coming on and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.